and I, I want to welcome the the uh, the audience and of course uh, Sam, Dr. Sam Yi, uh, uh, to come to this uh, first uh, CubeSat seminar. Uh, we are because we are planning, we are we are, we are starting a CubeSat, uh, how to say, science and technology program. Hopefully, in future, right now also. Uh, so we are uh, starting this uh, platform to to get more information, to exchange information, and to uh, try to develop uh, international cooperation in that sense. Also, the then today we have uh, five talks uh, in the morning session. We have three talks in afternoon session. We have two more uh, on March 11th. Uh, we have another one, the number two uh, seminar uh, webinar. The now, the, this first talk will be given by Dr. Sam Yi of uh, Johns Hopkins University Applied Physics Lab. I, I met uh, Sam, uh, I, if he still remember, uh, 30 some years ago, 30 years ago, right? That's uh, right. Yeah, when we were uh, starting the SPO. And uh, of course, uh, API, APL is, was instrumental in, in, in training the, the first uh, generation of space engineers, space scientists, uh, the, and Sam uh, was heavily involved. And then the, so I'm very happy that, you know, he, he is going to present to us uh, this uh, very, I would say, ingenious mission using CubeSat technology to study a very, actually, this is Stephen Spitting, uh, in fact, uh, he will tell you it's a very elegant method to study the magnetic field of the Earth. Okay, Sam, please start. Good morning, and I think, on, if you're in Taiwan and good evening if, if you're in the States. Uh, I would like to uh, take the opportunity to talk to you about EASY. EASY is called Electrojet Zeeman Imaging Explorer. And this EASY mission is a recently selected NASA heliophysics mission, mission of opportunity that does high value science uh, within the mission of opportunity budget. And this budget is capped about about, about $60 million US dollars. Uh, I'm the uh, principal investigator of the EASY mission. And we are in the phase B, we just started, and uh, we have about five years to, uh, uh, three years to develop and two years to collect the data. So on behalf of the entire EASY team, I would like to thank you, Wynn and, and, and the ACU and the Taiwan, to invite me to uh, give, give, uh, give this talk so I can introduce you about the uh, EASY mission. So what is EASY? Easy is a cost-effective multi-cubesat mission, actually three cubesat missions, and flying in a, on a pearls on a screen stream type of configuration. And the mission itself will visualize, basically, will look at for the first time the electrojets. Electrojets are the uh, electrical currents flowing at an altitude about 100 to 130 kilometers, and observe their spatial structures and temporal evolution using an innovative multi-view instrument and sensing technique. These electrojets are notoriously difficult to explore, simply because its altitude is about 100 to 130 kilometers, but critical for the energy coupling between the sun, the solar winds, magnetosphere, and Earth's upper atmosphere. So easy way to resolve mysteries of these electrojets and paves the way for better space weather prediction. Earth, uh, we said, is an anchor of the Sun-Earth space weather chain. Earth's neutral atmosphere and ionosphere are energet energetically and dynamically coupled to the Sun and the nearby geospace. Its spatial structure and temporal variation, now we call it space weather, are closely tied to the varying energy inputs from the Sun, would be the solar radiation or the solar winds. And from the low, am low atmosphere waves propagating from below, and how the Earth processes them and exchanges them with the geospace neighbors. So many geophysical parameters and observe observ phenomena manifested from the Sun-Earth interactions thus, thus contain critical information about the Sun, magnetosphere, ionosphere, and at atmosphere coupling processes. Electrical currents manifested in the ionosphere are fundamental to energy and momentum transfer within the geospace. There are four chains, solar radiation chain, solar energetic particle chains, and solar wind and magnetosphere chain 
and lower atmospheric chain. All those energy from diff through different things can affect the structure of the thermosphere and ionosphere. Today, we know that a vast current system exists in a couple of different regions of the Earth space, including the atmosphere, ionosphere, and magnetosphere. The important low altitude closure current, with around 100 kilometers, 130 kilometers, of the high latitude field line current system, field line current system, is the auroral electric jets. We call it AEJ. Another type of electric jet also exists on Earth, the equatorial electric jet, clearly located near the equator. And there's two kinds. Also, there's, a, there's, a, there's another kind, but a lot weaker. So the underlying phys physics behind, between the two are different. The AEJ, the auroral electric jet, is associated with the interactions between the ionosphere, magnetosphere, and solar winds, while the equatorial electric jet, EEJ, is associated with the interaction between the ionosphere and the neutral atmosphere. Both currents hold the key to our understanding of how solar radiation and energy responsible for the equatorial electric jet and the solar wind energy responsible for the auroral electric jets are processed, partitioned, and transported within the entire magnetosphere and upper atmosphere and neutral, you know, the whole uh, uh, ITEM system. Easy is designed to measure the mesoscale structure. Mesoscale, we meant a few hundred kilometers of these two electrojets and their temporal evolution with the primary focus on the electro aurora electric jets during the substorms to discern the physical mechanism of its generation and the secondary focus on the equatorial electric jets to review the electrodynamic effect of the upward propagating waves on the electrojet structure and ionosphere above. So electric jets near 100 kilometers, that altitude, however, are very, very difficult to measure. It's simply because uh, it's too high for, uh, 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 for balloon or, or some kind of measurements and too low for, for satellite to come down and infrequent rocket experiments is not adequate. So the strength of the direction of the currents in the atmosphere, including the Earth ionosphere and the solar atmosphere, have been obtained for measurements of the vector magnetic fields they, induces, they induce, and have generally been obtained using two methods, the in situ methods and the remote sensing method. Basically, try to measure the current, and you just measure the magnetic field around the currents. And from the magnetic field, the spatial distribution of the magnetic field, you can derive the current direction as well as the strength. So traditionally, for the, for the um, Study of the current systems in near Earth space, their induced magnetic fields have all been obtained using the in situ methods, which involves the use of the magnetometer either on the ground or in space because you want to measure magnetic fields. However, the spatial resolution of the current measurements are poor if the magnet magnetometers are placed far away from the current sources. For example, if you put a magnetometer in a 400 kilometer satellite altitude and try to measure the magnetic fields at, uh, uh, generated by the currents of 100 kilometers. First of all, the magnetic field will be a lot weaker. Second of all, the resolution will be very poor. So the remote sensing method, however, involves a radiative emission originating near the current source and the measurement of the effect of its spectral properties induced by the magnetic field present. So if you can make the measurements of a radiation is coming from an altitude very close to electric jet altitude, at the same time, that radiation you measure is affected by the magnetic field generated near that electric jet altitude. Then you can derive magnetic fields very close to, to the current. So if the emission is very close to the current, so your most sensing method can provide current measurement with significantly improved spatial resolu resolution. So easy, basically, use the remote sensing methods. So many dedicated mag magnetic field measurement missions have flown over the years using in situ methods. They all use in situ methods. So the early in situ magnetic field measurements of the MAXAT, for example, near in 1980, confirmed the existence of the field line current that the one I just showed is a large scale 
currents connect the magnetosphere and the ionosphere. So 60 years after Berkeley proposed in 1908. So it took 60 years to, for, for the MAGSAT to confirm, yes, there indeed existence of this field line currents. Today, using the same in situ methods, but with much improved magnetometers, we can get mag you know, very precise, also the, uh, vector magnetic field, you know, very uh, uh, good mag magnetometers, and sample methods, you can put a magnetometer on multi-satellite with a certain distance apart. So such as Siemens, Swarms, and Ampere. Uh, Ampere has 64 uh, satellites using the Iranian satellites. So all around, flying around, uh, around the globe. So you have simultaneous measurements, you know, for magnetometer measurements. That, that system, we can get more insights into the spatial structure and temporal evolution of this vast current system. But all this method, simply because they use magnetic magnetometers, they have difficulties, they have, you know, to measure the aurora electric jets at 103, 100 kilometers, because simply because they're too far away, also spatial resolution not enough. To achieve easy science measurement goals, easy focus on the new frontier of near earth magnetic field measurements. Spatially mapping the massive scale B and magnetic field variations, the spatial resolution on the order of one to 200 kilometers, very small scale, compared to the bigger scales like the like like, like themas, we call them mac macro scales. The spatial scale is about two thousand, several thousand kilometers. So easy uses a newly developed, a successfully demonstrated remote sensing method that measure a naturally present radiation that is strongly influenced by the magnetic fields near the current. So in our case, the electric jets. So this new sensing methods allow us to study the electric jets at a significantly improved spatial resolution than Themis, Swarm, and Ampere, a critical requir requirement for easy mission. A combination of ingredients that sets easy apart from the previous missions. And, and also we, we carry out uh, some special studies to ensure its measurement capability can meet our science objective. So in addition to the uh, compelling <coughs> science questions that we, you know, the mission will address, these ingredients also include the utilization of innovative Zeeman remote sensing technique. I'll say a little bit more about what this technique actually uh, um, means. And, a, and the utilization of small and compact and heritage multi view spectral radiometers. So use very small instrument so we can house that instrument on a CubeSat. And three mature 6U spacecraft CubeSat fly in the pearls on the string configurations with managed space by distance separation. I'll talk about this as well. And utilization of a resource optimized measurement schemes. Last, we, we use a, a, some simulation experiment to prove and demonstrate that our data analysis algorithm works and can produce the measurement with the precision we need so we can ensure the science closure. So I'm gonna try to touch upon each of these uh, uh, bullets right here. First, science. The rural electric jets are parts of the vast electrical systems that I just mentioned, that couple the sun, magnetosphere, and the ionosphere. So the driver of the magnetosphere ionosphere system, the MI system, is the solar winds. The solar wind provides the energy which is stored in the magnetosphere shown in here, on the left, and subsequently released. So true heating, the frictional dissipation of this large current system at the aurora electric altitude. Basically, the currents come in and, and then go through the ionosphere and leave the ionosphere. And the, the dissipation of energy near the, in the lower altitude provides a very large heating source for the lower thermosphere, for the thermosphere. So the structure of the magnetosphere might not be as smooth as shown here, as predicted by the, uh, uh, by, by, the, by the model. So its spatial structure and temporal changes affect how the energy is released and where it, it is deposited. 
Zhong Luo electric jets that plays a very important role in the energy transfer between the magnetosphere and ionosphere and the thermosphere. So you can see the structure is not that smooth. Right? And there's a whole current system and how the energy deposit will be affected by the structure of the, of the magnetosphere. So the same thing, the Aurora electric is shown in the curve, uh, arrow here also contains structure. And uh, structure so you, okay, you come back, thank you. Yeah. Okay, a little bit too slow. Okay, maybe there's some kind of delay, right? Okay, so this energy release is a loading and unloading cycle as the magnetic field line stretch in compression as shown in this animation. And it, it's explosive in nature. So the massive scale spatial structure and the temporal evolution of the closure current, the electric jets, contain the information on the mechanism of how the energy store is being released. So therefore, the electrical current plays a central role in the transport of energy from the magnetosphere to the ionosphere where it is dissipated. So this dynamic coupling between the magnetosphere and the ionosphere is an observational challenge simply because, you know, because it's so difficult to measure at this particular altitude, but it's exactly what easy a three cube set we are able. So easy mission success hinges on answering two primary science associated with the Aurora electric jets. Primary science question number one, what is the structure and evolution of the Aurora electric jet segment in the substance wedge? Substone is a fundamental global reconfiguration of the magnetosphere during which energy is abruptly transported to the ionosphere, as I just described it previously, right? the, the loading and unloading processes, right? and, when, you know, and how energy is being deposited and dissipated. So central to this phenomenon is the Aurora electric jet. So an electric jet, Aurora electric jet, represent the ionospheric component of the, of the 3D current system. So this aurora electric jet, known as the substorm current wedge, so it linked the ionosphere and the magnetosphere during substorm. So despite its importance, however, the configuration of the substorm current wedge is still very poorly characterized, simply because the, you know, the, uh, the spatial resolution is just you know, small but cannot be measured from space, even from the ground. So it's a very poorly uh, characterized and has been harshly debated for 45 years. So based on limited observation, several configurations have been proposed over the years, including the original single loop model, showing on the left here, proposed by McDonald back in 1974. That was it. Single loop model, very straightforward. Current come in, go into the ionosphere, go through the aurora electric jet uh, and the, and the uh, high latitude Peterson current system, coming out and leave the system. And this very simple view, this very simple single loop, and that was proposed in 1974. And in 2014, for example, there's a, a two-loop model, right, in about 2014. And then also there's 2014, uh, uh, there's another called double wedge model. And all this, you can see that the structure of the current system are different from, from the left, the original 74 in the middle, of, of, of the uh, Sergeyev at all night 2014, also the Gerloff and Hoffman 2014. You see all the structures are different. But the most important thing, if you see that, the, the, the difference, the major differences are very close to the midnight sector. So to propose model differ in the electric jet configuration all around midnight. So, so the key thing is, if we can fly a mission across the midnight, across the midnight sector, have the right spatial resolution, we can see the differences between the original 2000, uh, 1974 model all the way to the modern 2014 model. And then can really settle this big debate in terms of how the energy is being triggered, uh, the uh, deposition coming down to the ionosphere. So throughout its mission lifetime of about 18 months, data collection about 18 months, Easy is expected to encounter statistically about 170 substorms, each with about 300 well characterized distributed magnetic field measurement at the right place and the right time, with the spatial resolution needed to provide long salt closure to decades old and much debated mysteries of how the magnetosphere 
and the ionosphere are coupled. All right, you can see this, all right? And if we can be going, find the spatial separations with the four beams and flying through it with the three spacecraft, and right here, the question here, the question mark here, and we can really see what's going on of the closure current, what the structure near the midnight sector. So that's our, our goal of the mission. The first primary goal, to resolve the debate. The second primary goal is to answer a newly evolved science question regarding the spatial structure of the aurora electric jets. As the models increase their spatial resolution, competing theory also arises. Are the aurora electric jets made of a simple large-scale looped current system shown on the, uh, on, on the left here? Or, or, you know, it could be a two-loops model. So whatever is a very large-scale current system. Or multiple wedgelets, as shown here on the right. Who at all 2018? So whether the, the, the current system, the wedge is a simple wedge or actually made up of multiple, multiple wedges. So easy will provide measurements with the spatial resolution needed to resolve this new debate, simply because we are going to provide small scale measurements, small spatial scale measurements, just the one shown on the right here, three spacecraft, four being flying through it with a spatial separation and also spatial uh, uh, resolution to see the smaller structure, smaller scale structure of, of the wedges. So why maps? So a good analogy in the water is, is the waterfall structure, you know, sort of scenario, like, like the waterfall structure. So although the same amount of water falling from, from the top, how, how the water falls and what its structure like is, you know, as it come down, it is structured on the left or smooth on the right, have significant effects on the disturbances of the water from beneath the waterfalls. So in other words, one on the right, smooth coming down, so the water become linear, the flow, and, and you know, whatever the water from, uh, falling on, on, on lower part, it just generate this sort of turbulences, and then, and then disturbance just, just generate that way. Or the water can come down from like, like the one on the left. Right? So the same amount of water coming down, be a lot more structure. So each one has its, you know, uh, uh, for, for, for the one on the left, we have a very intense water fall on one particular spot. So the energy that position would be a uh, structure and would generate a lot of waves propagating from high latitude to low latitude. So the whole response and effect on ionosphere is different. So that's one, another thing that we can, we can address if we have the measurements, just like I said before, also spatial resolution, we can really delineate whether it's a simple, single wedge, big, large scale structure, or actually made, made of multiple wedges. So during the seasons that EASY is not making aurora electric gear measurement, high latitude aurora electric gear measurement, we will study the mesoscale structure of the equatorial electric jet. Equatorial electric jets are a lot more and better understood so, however, the smaller scales of aurora electric, electric jets, just like an uh, equatorial electric jets, just like aurora electric jets, poorly understood the measurement to really to, to, to see the smaller scale perturbation of the electric jets, equatorial electric jet system. All right. And then the most important thing is this is low, low latitude one, and they're 105 kilometers, and there's neutral and winds, and everything is highlighted by the wave propagating from below. So the structure arising from the propagating gravity waves can affect its low latitude electric jet. At the same time, can change the electrodynamics near that region because ion collision frequency, uh, plasma and neutral collision frequency so high and consequently change the electric field distribution and then affect the ionosphere above. So we, this mission, we take advantage of easy measurement capability. we we'll try to, to understand, try to characterize the smaller scales of the aurora uh, equatorial electric jet system. So the key for the easy measurements is its ability to obtain B measurements induced by the electric jet with significantly higher spatial resolution than we have ever had done before, ever gotten before. Like I said, Peter said many times. So instead of using conventional in situ methods, 
easy visualized currents remotely by measuring magnetic field perturbation using an old technique working in the laboratory, even in space, applied in a new way. So the principle behind the remote sensing methods that easy employs is the Zeeman effect on the emission absorption line naturally present in the atmosphere. So is Zeeman, in fact, discovered by Zeeman back in 1897. Because of the discovery, Zeeman actually won the Nobel Prize in physics. It's the effect of the splitting of the electric spectral line into several components in the presence of external magnetic fields. So, so two spectral properties of Zeeman splitting have been exploited by the experimentalists to obtain remotely the magnetic field information of a target. So first, the magnetic fields of the split is proportional you know, to the total strength of the magnetic field. So in other words, a line showing on the left, which is now shifted, now split, in the presence of the magnetic field will split. And the amount of splitting, delta lambda, is proportional, actually wave number, is proportional to the strength of the external magnetic field, the total strength. So it doesn't matter what the, the direction is the total magnetic field. But second, the magnitude of these, uh, the Zeeman lines are polarized. And, and their type of polarization, linear or circular, the relative intensities of the shifted and unshifted line depends on the angle between the light viewing line, line of sight and B. So, so in, in other words, if one can measure the polarization, you can have a very good handle on the viewing direction angle and, mag and the magnetic field angle. In other words, you can, you can measure the magnetic field vector. The former gives the total strength. You can split, give you total strength of the magnetic field, and the latter, by polarization, gives us the vector magnetic field. So this is this effect, the, the splitting effect was discovered way back you know, in, in 1897, and then the more research got carried out in the polarization. So, so both techniques have been used. To, 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 to remotely get magnetic fields, especially even for us, for the helium physics research. So Zeeman sensing has been used for years by the solar physics community, from the ground or even in space, to study the science magnetic fields. So magnetic fields in the science park discovered through observations of the Zeeman effect, based on the magnitude of the split, the one showing on the left. You know, X, X direction is like frequency, like spectrum frequency. A Y direction is the cut, spatially cut. And the, and the dark spot is the, uh, is, is the science spot. As, as you do an imaging spectrograph, you see that right at the uh, location where the science spot is located, the line broadened. Actually, if you look carefully, actually split it. So in other words, if discovery uh, of the, and the location of the science spot, magnetic fields are a lot stronger simply by using this, uh, 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 this Zeeman technique. And from the split, you can determine the magnetic field strength the science part. Today, vector magnetic field measurements have also been obtained for the polarization property of the Zeeman effect emission line. For example, the image of the vector magnetic fields in an active region, similar active region science spot, such as the results shown on the right obtained by the HMI instrument SDO. But this instrument simply measured the polarization of a particular neon line near the visible, uh, I don't know, actually, uh, near 6,000 angstrom. Just just use the polarization alone. Did not use the total strength because they did not have spectral resolution to resolve the line. So it's a solar magnetic field measurement line at a visible width with an used. H HMI used the uh, iron line at 6173 angstroms. So the Earth magnetic fields are it's about 10,000 times weaker than that of the solar magnetic fields, which is about 2,000 gauss, which is the last. A lot stronger, 10,000 times stronger. So in other words, if you use the same visible line, there's no way one can resolve the splitting caused by the, by the magnetic field. So that's why the Earth, most of the air glow features uh, is not affected by, by, by the Earth's magnetic field at all. People usually just ignore it. Okay. So in order to, do, to find the right line to do the right job, you have to go into a complete different way, line, line of the different wavelength. So a line at much longer wavelength is therefore needed for Earth magnetic field measurement because simply because the, the fields are not weak. So easy brings the Zeeman magnetic field measurement technique to Earth to prove of concept 
and demonstrate the same thing concept using the MLS, which is microwave lens on the, on the aura, on the aura satellite, which is Earth science transmission. So limb observations of the O2 118 gigahertz line. So O2 118 gigahertz line is the thermal emission line. Ground state, ground vibrational state, ground, and, and, and J equal to zero, J equal to one transition. Basically the lowest rotational vibrational band. A good line in there, and the wave, you know, the, the frequency, but 118 gigahertz. Uh, and then the very, very long wavelength. So this emission is uniformly present in the atmosphere because the O2, right, is, is always there. And the spectral radiance has been used to obtain pressure and temperature profile of lower thermosphere. That's what the whole mission is dedicated for. And there's also different frequency of the O2. They can get the, uh, the, the, the pressure, temperature pressure profile. So that's what Earth science emissions do. Showing on the left, basically showing the limb observation of MLS, all right, looking at the uh, 118 gigahertz of a different tangent height. You can see the line actually zero position is, is split into two sigma lines, shifted to two sigma lines and one and shifted pi lines. Okay, and the high altitude, higher tangent height is almost like emission feature. Lower tangent height is an absorptive feature because they're optically thin. thin. So based upon this separation, right, you can get the uh, you can get a total magnetic field, right, like the z in fact. So the one showing on the left are three orbits full of measurements of this this particular line, and zero position zero position is the 118 gigahertz center, and you can see the split about one megahertz split okay, out of the 118 gigahertz, right? and then you can see that near the equator the magnetic field usually is weak, uh, a weaker could be about 34 up to 4,000 nanotesla. Near the pole is about 65, 60,000 nanotesla. So you can see this z bound effect. As you move to the pole, to the equator, to the pole, to the equator, you can see the line started, the separation varies. High latitude, 65,000 nanotesla showing on the left, on the right, and you can see the line separation clear. So based upon this measurement, so one can get the total magnetic field. So from this data set, I used this data set and 12 years of data. I was able to demonstrate that if I can pull out a split, then I can look at those split and I can get the, uh, the perturbation of, uh, of the, the total magnetic fields and look at that perturbation and sh the one figure showing on the, on the, on the left. Basically derived the perturbation of the magnetic fields okay, in a polar coordinate system for typical aurora electric activities of AE index of 400 nanotests. Remember, the Earth rotation, Earth magnetic field is about 65, 60,000, 40,000 to 60,000 nanotests. And we're trying to pull out a few hundred nanotests as well. So one, we, one thing we have to do is take, make the measurements, subtract the geomagnetic main field, get this perturbation. And look at this perturbation, we can create a map. And that map is very consistent with the statistical map of the electro, electro jets basically showing the peak of the electric jet near the, near the midnight sector at zero o'clock in here is the westward flowing and then northward of that westward if you use the right hand rule northward the wet uh, 65 degree magnetic latitude uh, a current going through is a uh, magnetic field going downward if you just use the right hand rule which one we show the delta p is positive and south of the 65 degree and delta p is minus negative and right at 65 degree magnetic field perturbation near zero so, so whatever we get from the total magnetic field is very consistent with the statistical map of, you know, of, of, of the, what we expect of the electro electric equipment or aurora electric jet. But this is 12 years statistics. Right? We cannot do an event study simply, first of all, equate the noise, second of all, uh, the, the measurements are limb, so resolution is not that great. So it's important to know that MLS aura measurements are inadequate to address the question that easy poses because they're, you know, they're just total magnetic field not good enough. We, we need to know the, the vector magnetic field and we need to know the current directions. So it also resolution is poorer because of the measurement. So in addition, the MLS instrument is large. Its antenna is one meter simply because they want to look at the limb. They want to get about six kilometers spatial vertical resolution. You know, by the design, the, the, the uh, diffraction limited, you have had a huge antenna. So very, okay. very, very interesting. Yeah. So technology employs is also two to three decades old. So as described later, 
easy uses a suite of low size, small size, low weight, and low power sensor. It significantly improved the noise performances, making it possible to fly on a 6U CubeSat. So we'll use the you know, 2000, you know, 2000, uh, 10, 2020 technology to, 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 to make easy possible. So easy optimize the Z on B sensing technique by first looking at the negative directions. Second, uh, characterizing the polarization state of the O2, 118 gigahertz. So we, we use the same line, uh, but we look at, for, instead of looking at them, we look at negative. The second one, instead of looking just the spectrum, just in, then we also look at the polarization. So viewing at the negative directions, not only reduces the required antenna size from one meter of MLS size antenna down to five centimeters in order to get the same spatial resolution, but also allow the magnetic field measurement to be obtained at about 20 to 30 kilometers below the electrojet altitude that the one showing you here on the left here. So whatever the highest weight where the magnetic fields are measured is about 80 kilometers, which is about 20 kilometers below the current system, which is ideal. The closer, the better, the spatial resolution is better. So the comparison of the spatial resolution obtained by using easy remote Zeeman techniques from the traditional in situ methods using magnetometers are shown in the right, on the right. So you can see that now for us to put a sensor on any altitude looking straight down, 80 kilometer altitude, our spatial resolution is less than, uh, less than 78, uh, 60 kilometers compared to the ground, it's a few hundred, you know, one or two hundred kilometers from, from 500 kilometers satellite is about a thousand kilometers. So our, our spatial resolution significantly improved by using the Zeeman technique. Easy, easy also op optimizes the Zeeman sensing technique by obtaining the polarization state of the O2 118 gigahertz line. So Zeeman line, like I said, is polarized. And also we talk about the relative intensity depends on the angle between the viewing and the surrounding. So the one showing here, so if the observation showing on the, as a, as a red arrow, a magnetic field is a dark arrow. So if you're looking perpendicular to the magnetic field, and then you two, uh, the line, the unsplit line, the non-shifted line showing on the red is red. They're all, both, all linearly polarized, and, but the, uh, if a perpendicular, that the, uh, the, the, the down shifted line is horizontally polarized, shifted line are vertically polarized. So, so e either, e even for the linear polarization, you can have horizontal and vertical polarization. So you can measure the states of that, like that. And then if you're looking parallel to the magnetic field, on the contrary, right, and the sigma line, the down shifted line disappear. There are only two, two shifted lines. One line is right-hand circularized, the other one is left-hand circularized. So if you can measure the all four strokes, the polarization state of the line, you can either determine the angle between the observation on our side and magnetic field angle. So in other words, you can get the magnetic fields, right? The, the vectors. Right? And then of course, making any angles, you can you can you can determine those just from the four polarizations. So so what the word easy does is not only measure the complete spectrum, but we also measure the polarization. So, so, of course, only linearly polarized, the O2, uh, 118 radius is obtained by MLS. And they're all, but only one day, are the vertically polarized radiuses. So it's shown on the, on the right here. Right? On the top, is vertically linearly polarized for the limb observation near 80 kilometers, uh, you know, a different location, equatorium, you get equator north and, uh, and north, or equator. So if you look at the limb uh, at, at high latitude, and then get a few lines basically upward, and then you're looking at the limb. So, in other words, it's the case on the left, right? Because your line of sight is almost almost perpendicular to the magnetic field line, and then the sigma <coughs> line shifted line disappear, as you shown here. The north, south, the center line disappear. Only the two linearly polarized lines are present. And then, however, if you look at horizontally polarized, you see only at pole only the non shifted line presence, and then shifted line disappear. So for this two, combination of two, you already can tell a little bit about the direction of the beam. So that's what, you know, what the easy is, is designed to. We're gonna measure the complete polarization, not just linear polarization, linear direction, but also the circular polarizations.
right? So this is just showing the full stroke parameter we measured and looking at the directions and looking straight down for the magnitude of what we see, we can see the polarization state from, from the four stokes. And then the degree of polarization, is, you know, uh, about 20% polarization and, and all that. And then looking at the changes of this degree of polarization, and you can determine the, uh, the electromagnetic fields. So in summary, as illustrated here, EASY uses the same O2 line optimize the sensing technique and not only measure the entire Zeeman spectrum, the one showing in the box here, right, to obtain the total magnetic field from the two spindles, split lines, split line, you can see as magnetic field changes and the line separation changes. Also using the, the polarization property, you can see the polarization started changing as the angle changes, the vector changes. So we use the combination of these two to give us the, the, the magnetic field. So easy, also use a very compact, downward looking spectrum spectral perimeters, basically natural spectrum, as well as polarization state. The whole polarization spectrum of the 180 kilohertz in The so viewing downward allows the magnetic field vector at about 20 to 30 kilometers below the electric jets to obtained, improving the policy system. So the most important thing is, in order to obtain the desired spatial and temporal sampling frequency of the electric jet, to address the science question raised by EASY, for example, 12 space track, with each equipped with a magnetometer would be required if you use the conventional method. But we have four view, three space track. So in order to get a four view spatial structure, also temporal evolutions, we need 12 space track. With each one have a magnetometer. So the use of a four view band sensors reduce not only the number of space track required from 12 down to three, but also the complexity of the orbit maintenance maintain the separations. That's the cost of the mission. So most importantly, man sensing, the use of sensing technique provides measurement is significantly improved spatial resolution than those obtained by space form. So even they use the 12 space spacecraft that you cannot address the easy sign. That's very important, cost saving, also smaller scale. So the key to be able to carry out this easy mission is this compact, small instrument and the CubeSat. So the easy payload instrument, um, we got a map, microwave electro jet, uh, consists of four miniaturized heterodyne spectrometer, leverages over two decades of investment from the Earth Science Division by using technology developed, flight tested, and performance demonstrated for the tempest D, which is Earth Science measured temperature, pressure, you know, today, like we said before, and the cube RRT, 6U cube submission. So the antenna and the receiver front end are taken from the heritage design, tempest D. Uh, spectral and uh, spectral back end to taken from cube RRT. So in other words, we use the technology developed for the earth sciences to compact 30 years of the investment of the earth sciences and take bring it over to Helio and make our measurement. So both Tempers D and Cube RRT launched in May 2018 and have, have been operational since then, continuously collecting data for nearly two two and a half years. So as of today, both of them are still operating. So easy, provide a low risk approach to achieve science objective by using a mature heritage Blue Canyon 6U bus. So we, we use a 6U bus and then uh, all, so significant heritage across the whole system and multiple satellite ensure science success. We only need two because we only need two to know the separation, you know, different temporal separation. And BCT spacecraft, Blue Canyon spacecraft accommodates the MEM instrument with positive performance margins. So easy leverage availability um, of commercial ride share services via spaceflight. So this is the configuration of the six use cubes, cube set and the instrument is sitting marked in the area, the little box area in the in, 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 uh, marker in blue. So that's the size that you easily accommodate all four views of the antenna of the sensors that we need. We can, we can accommodate. The other thing is easy leverages differential drag maneuvers to provide needed spacecraft separation. Because on, on the three spacecraft, we need to control the separation. So we can make measurements like two minutes apart, four minutes apart, 10 minutes apart. So very free. So we can, through our observation, we can use drag to, to set the separation. So 
to, to change the separation of different space between spacecraft. So no propulsion substance is required. So we so that's reducing the overall system complexity. So maneuvers achieved by changing attitude state. Basically, we use the spacecraft to do most of the scanning using the reaction wheels. Strong heritage track has been used for Cygnus, which is Earth Sciences mission, and CATS, which is APL, uh, a CubeSat mission as well, two CubeSat mission. But both easy, the, uh, the, the, this differential drags are a lot easier of performance back. It's a lot relaxed than Cygnus and CATS. So APL, uh, we all the uh, navigation using the, our, our CATS uh, um, heritage. Right? So basically, we just change the spatial orientation when we're not taking the data to, to maximize the drag and change the drag so we can, we can manage to, 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 to vary the separation between the spacecraft. So the key thing is, because you resources are limited, so we really optimize the observation plan. All right. So in, in, in summer, so during the summer, summertime, northern summer, uh, southern summer, we use high latitude measurement, they looking at aurora electric jets. All right. So the, the observation sequence always start before we end, right after we enter the observational high latitude region, we look straight up to look at the galactic background, background basically look at the temperature of the sensors and all that to remove the background, establish the background, then, then move the space by later, take the measurements. After that, we'll make another sky look observation. So this mode, every time we fly, fly into a certain magnetic latitude, in our, in our case, 50 degree magnetic latitude, we measure the overall electric jet. So, so and then when we leave that, you know, when the measurements of the uh, uh, either use the drag, then you try to drag analysis uh, maneuver or looking at the satellite charging. So during the equinox, because uh, you know, the way space will always flies through the equator, so equinox we make the same measurements of the equatorial electric jet showing in here. So this is a simulation just to, to illustrate what's going on. And the green circle is a 55 degree. Uh, and that led to circle, right? I want to make sure I mark it correct. Right? Okay. You can see the space tracker come in. The first space track pitched up. So the first space track making the sky look, measurement, background look, and then later looking at the Earth and look at it. Oh, right, actually, you had the second space track doing the same thing, starting with the sky look. And then the first one exit the circle and move pitch up again. You make another sky look measurement so we can calibrate it up the temperature effect. Of the measurement. So this is just repeat itself. Every time you fly through high latitude, three satellite is doing this. Right? So the, the key thing is, as the uh, as you in the day side, you basically come out of the charging mode. On the night side, once you get in, into the night side, you do the drag maneuvers. So basically, very efficiently uh, manage the, uh, the resources we need for the observations. Like I said, the orbit is sun sync, high latitude, midnight crossing into the science, all right? And then it, it's day side, sun charging, science, night side, drag maneuvers. Very, very uh, compact and very, very efficient use of all the resources. One thing is very important for us is because of the complexity of the whole thing, we have to demonstrate that we have the capability to make measurements also have the sensor uh, to noise performance that meet our requirement. So we have conducted, we call it realistic end-to-end -end observ observing system simulation experiment. Right now, we all call ASI, to prove that it will reach the science project. In other words, ASI is experiment to simulate exactly what a space drive will see. So for sensor event and all that, we add the sensor in there, we add the noise in there, we add the noise instrument, field of view, everything try to simulate the experiment as close as possible. Then we perform the retrieval. So, the, for example, the first step is global MHE model to simulate the current system, simulate the smaller scale of uh, uh, the energy field distribution. Then we fly the spacecraft with the full view with the similar geometry. So that's the second step, observation event simulation. Uh, and the third step, we calculate the radiance. The, what four models tell us, or the radiances or the four polarizations. Right? And then, then we run through the instrument and produce what the instrument will see, and we add a noise. And then once we have the simulated data, we run through the algorithm to retrieve the magnetic fields, and from the magnetic fields, we retrieve the current. 
So at the end, we basically compare the one shown here, the first drop back in here showing you what's input of the magnetic field of the current system. And at the end, what is the output of retrieval and compare the just whether you know the retrieval accuracy precision, whether we can retrieve it. And all the algorithm can be demonstrated. So the retrieval results can compare with the model inputs to verify the validity of the retrievals and the readiness of our data processing algorithm. And that's very, very important. So we are able to demonstrate that. So the, the ASI we conducted clearly demonstrates that our data algorithm worked and the easy can indeed resolve the spatial structure as we've shown in here and the structures of the current system can recover. So this is one thing that very, for us, that, you know, from, 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 from the very beginning to the end, we simulate experiment, we demonstrate that uh, experiment works at the same time, we demonstrate that our retrieval algorithm also worked. So the last slide, I would just want to show you a top level mission schedule and a major milestone. So we just started and phase B, we, you know, contract negotiation just started. We're in, 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 en route to have April 1st start of the phase B and total mission. We expect to end by 2026, you know, about three years development time and the launch should be sometime in 2024 with about 18 months of data collections. And this is different phases of the mission. The total cost of the mission is capped cap at about 60 million US dollars. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Sam, for such a wonderful lecture and congratulations. You know, uh, uh, I think you must have worked. How long have you worked on this, you know, on this mission? Uh, I, I think um, I started, uh, I wrote my first paper in 2017 about the concept. So, well, one can measure the magnetic field from the Z-bound and uh, splitting. And I started looking into the polarization, trying to make it that. So you can see that I think I started making the, do the data analysis probably sometime in 2015, 2017, and published paper 2017 and wrote a proposal 2019. And selected 2020. So. so it's very, very quick and, and very successful operation, I would say. Yeah. Um, yes, I, I think. Yeah, I think. Our, I think the the reason is so uh, selected. I think is because it is innovative. I think the technique itself. Mm -hmm. So the first time. And by the way, we are also developing multi-view, uh, multiple channels magnetometer like uh, and needle lens. So instead mm -hmm. of just four channels, we can, mm -hmm. we, we're going to have an energy in the future. So for mm -hmm. this. Um, okay, I want to ask the audience whether anyone have any questions to, to, to Sam. And if you have, okay. um, uh, then please unmute yourself and, and yeah. Okay, uh, this is Charles. Can, um, hi, Sam. Hi, how are you? Charles Lin. Yes, hi, Charles. Hi, yeah. Um, it, hi, good to see you. So uh, I see the, uh, uh, the, the figure of the uh, OC that uh, you mentioned that you use the M global MHD model. Mm -hmm. I wonder in that, can you do the same thing using the atmosphere electron dynamic model to produce the necessary current needed, or you have to yes. use the MHD model for magnetosphere? Which one is required yeah. for I, I think that, that's a very good question. All right. and the, the one I use, I demonstrate that the MHD model is for the aurora electro jets. Okay? And we're doing the same thing now for the equatorial electro jets, which use the atmospheric model. Okay, I see. Thanks. Yeah, the, the, you know, one is global MHD focused mainly on high latitude, greater than 50 degree magnetic latitudes. And then once you move away, to go down to equatorial electric jets, then we use the, uh, the atmospheric models. And that's what we're doing now for us. And, and the same, what was the advantage of using, using CubeSet? Oh, using, cubes, using CubeSet, I think the first thing is yeah. advantage. Yeah. Uh, I would say first thing is if the technology allowed cheaper and uh, then then uh, then have a higher chances of uh, of success to a certain degree. If you use a bigger spacecraft, all right, then try trying to fly three will, will be very cost prohibitive. And also, you know, uh, technology is there. The six U spacecraft is is there. So far, we also have experience. APL, we have. Uh, which is a 3U spacecraft, and CATS, which is two 6U spacecraft, all manufactured by, by BCT. So we have a very long history of collaboration with BCT. Also, Tempest D and also Cube RT, the one that sensor uh, radiometers on, also 6U uh, uh, CT bus. Mm -hmm. So, so mm -hmm. that's sort of a 
very logical collaboration of the three organizations. Just, just a side remark because I, I'm thinking of you asking some other colleagues from APL to give also talks on on CubeSat. Maybe you could introduce some of them to us. You know. Um, oh yeah. Okay. Right. Yeah, I think they want to do the Earth Sciences called Raven, try to measure the Earth radiation budget. Uh, mm. And CAT, of course, is a is a deal. You know, it's a military mission, so I don't know whether uh, you know they they give it. They can talk to you, but no, I mean, the, uh, the I'm not military. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, but Raven, like, definitely talk to you. It's very, very good. Uh, Raven mission is the Earth Sciences mission, how the radiometry can measure the radiation imbalance of the Earth, the long wave radiation coming from the Earth and the UV radiation coming in to look at the imbalance. And then because the imbalance is attributed to the total energy budget in the Earth atmosphere and related to climate change. And that's why you know, very precise measurements are required and accurate measurements are required. So there's certain technology involved in Raven. So I can ask, I can give you some uh, the PI names and we'll be happy to, to give a talk with this. Very good, I, I write to you, yeah, I write to you. Yeah. Uh, any other questions for Sir Sam? Uh, we can have still one more, one more questions. Uh, you obviously have a couple of minutes. Yes, yeah, sorry, I focused more on the science. So, but there are a lot no, of no, that's techniques. great. I mean, that's great because mm -hmm. it's a good demonstration how, how one should use sculpture to do science. Yeah. And other questions? If not, and I would, uh, by the way, uh, this, this video will be recorded, will have been recorded, well, so I'm, we will I'm put sorry. it on I'm the sorry. on the website, web page for. Wait, wait. I thought you said, that's a question. Hi, Wayne, I'm sorry. Uh, just a. Uh, oh, yeah, welcome no, to no, come not back. a question, no, just a, well, maybe the question will come in. Uh, because I see nobody asking for the question, so I, I'll just ask uh, one more. Be oh, go ahead. Because go ahead. Sam, this is a quite of a smooth choose. Uh, yeah. So so this this looks like a, the 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 mission was chosen. It's quite smooth, right? You 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 developed a concept in two thousand seventeen, mm -hmm. and then being started like a two or two or four years later, it's kind of a very successful one. I was just wondering yeah. that uh, um, how. Uh, it, it, it's really, uh, it's really. Normally, you won't expect this kind of a, uh, the speed being uh, being selected. I just want to know that uh, how how much innovation or how much need or when you talk to the when you talk to the mission selection team, selection team, how how do they comment on your 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 mission or how you persuade them to to, I, I, to, I, I, to choose I, I, your mission? It's just interesting yeah. to know some of the detail. <laughs> Yeah, I think that, that's very, very good questions. You know, you know that we have to go through step one, step two, uh, site visit, and also the finally I have to find a final one. I have to make a presentation to the administrators. All right, and then I, I think easy one because innovation, okay? because this technique had never been used for Earth. Okay, and this is the first technique. The Zeeman technique was fully utilized, not not just on the splitting, but also on the uh, on the polarization. So it has a tremendous tremendous application in the future. And you know, we can, you know, a better design sensors uh, for a different type of platform, we can image not just aurora electric jets, we can we can measure the current system in the field coming from the lower arcs at even smaller scales because simply because of that. And so so this technology, this technique is fully implemented has tremendous potential. So uh, I think uh, they really want to see whether uh, we, you know, to see that we can success, we can succeed. At the same time, I know the earth sciences have cube sets from before, and there's the helio had some smaller cube sets uh, on the on the, uh, on, on the we call the H ties, uh, no no cost no act no cost access to space and all that. So this is the the first bigger class of uh, of satellite missions utilizing of sort of constellations of cube sets. So that's another attractive technology. So, you know, here the physics will like to see it happen. Because from now on, most of the, you know, we have moved into a 3D time dependent type of studies. We really need to multiple satellite, measure the phenomena different places at the same time. And the multiple satellites is the most, uh, is the best way to, uh, to achieve those. So in order to do that, cost effective implementation is important. So CubeSat plays a very important role. 
Very good, uh, Sam. Thank I mean, I'm much. sure you will hear more from you, you know, in future. Uh, you are such a good lecturer. Uh, if you have any questions, please feel free to uh, send me an email. And thank you for inviting me. Okay. Thanks. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you.